Dr. Larry brings you another segment of Did You Know? We've all heard somebody say, I've got a bad knee. Or maybe we say it about ourselves. Because we ache as we age and our knees begin to rattle like a cage. Or maybe you're the weekend warrior or athletic type and after many years you know that pain or noise in your knee just ain't right. So eventually, at some point, many of us will have to handle some type of bone, joint, or knee issue. So where do you go for a knee that is about to blow? Yes, it's a field of choices, but when it comes to choosing an organization of experts for something as important as our knees, you want to pick a place that cares for you like your mom, dad, or Grandma Louise. So pay close attention to to our next guest. He's a practicing physician, board certified in the specialized field of bone and joint care, and he specializes in treating bad knees, including he does partial knee replacements, which will be the main focus of our two-part show. He's also a partner of an organization that has its processes and people, quote, operating like a well-oiled machine. So for the sake of simplicity, we'll call this segment Ask OSMS. Dr. Flannery, Welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you, Dr. Larry. Uh, great to be on. Always a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we can call you a pro now. Uh, you're, you're a repeat. We did anterior hip replacements a couple of months ago, which uh, got a lot of great feedback on that. And I know some patients from around the area have already headed that direction, uh, not just for anterior hip uh, evaluations, but for other things as well, too. And uh, we'll dive into a little bit of some Iron County folks and maybe just some comments about that in a second. But let's get a few of the formalities and a little fun out of the way first. So just give us your full name, license type, certification, board certs first. Yeah, Walker Flannery, um, board certified orthopedic surgeon, uh, physician owner with OSMS. Okay, and uh, where are some of the locations or the locations you see patients? Yeah, so I work out of our Green Bay office as well as our Marinette office. Uh, we do have others uh, seeing patients uh, down in the Fox Valley. Okay. And I know, um, and people have, have commented to the fact that they, they tend to like to go to either location, but um, how about maybe a couple of insights you've seen from folks coming from Iron County? What's been some of the feedback? Maybe, you know, I was using the Marinette office versus the Green Bay office, or what have you... What are some of the things you've seen? Like I've sat to some people at the store who made some comments. I saw Dr. Flannery and a real cool guy. And wow, what a, what a, what a smart surgeon. So have you have some insight on some folks that, since you did the show uh, from Iron County? Oh yeah, I, I, I've loved it. I, I think the, the folks coming down from Iron County have been fantastic. I think, you know, really um, Northwoods and small town feel, which, which I grew up around uh, being from Anago, Wisconsin and, um, you know, I think hardworking, uh, individuals are active in retirement and, and really looking to, uh, look at their overall health and, and get back to the things they love. So it, it's, uh, it's neat to have some shared hobbies. You know, we've talked about hunting and fishing and sports and, uh, and even, even cooking some brisket. So it, it's been pretty neat. <laughs> that was one of the funny things like we talked about before we started, uh, doing the segment here as I bumped into a guy who says, well, I saw him. He's going to do my anterior hip, and he likes beef brisket and likes to hunt, too. I said, well, that sounds like it was a good visit. Is it absolutely? <laughs> so that resonated well. So yeah. uh, in, in tune with that, what are some of your favorite foods to grill? Give us some hobbies you like and maybe some spare time stuff before we jump into the actual main gist of the show today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I definitely love uh, utilizing the smoker. And, uh, you know, if we're having a group of people, it's, it's definitely a, a pork butt. Um, uh, we like doing ribs. Uh, it's pretty neat though. My, my wife has, has found that she really likes it. And now sometimes I'm coming home and she's already got the, the ribs done. So, uh, so that's awesome. But yeah, brisket, I think is kind of the ultimate, but you, you do have to have some planning, you know, sometimes even starting it the night before. Yeah. Also, your wife is jumping on the, on the smoker now too and getting, getting things handled. Wow. My, yeah, yeah, it's been it's been pretty exciting. Yeah, I've um, so we get our grill fired up. We don't have a smoker, but uh, we've got a grill on our deck. Um, and so my wife mm -hmm. is a culinary specialist with six kids. She loves to to cook and bake and everything. And then she would leave the grilling to me. And then over the years, I would come home and she would she'd like all of a sudden, hey, you know what? I just grilled some chicken before you got home. 
and of course it's like oh awesome. yeah awesome so it's it's nice when the, when the wives too will take over the 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 smoker or the grill as well too and of course they do they've got their own little touches they do to it versus us guys sometimes although i think with guys and grilling we can com- we can compete really well with some of the the great cooks inside the house with our wives as well too there's nothing nothing like <laughs> nothing like getting the smoke or the grill just right you know yeah, yeah, the Weber charcoal grill is is the way to go. But yeah, more recently I have explored the the smoker a bit. So. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, as far as the shows, we're we're talking about a topic, and I I've, I've been slowly peppering this in, and uh, I've been talking about it on um, at, uh, at the end of my show that I got you coming on. So we we've already preloaded uh, the public that you're coming on to talk about partial knee replacements because really honestly, even when I'm when I'm working on cases and talking to people, I go, "How much you know about a partial knee?" And we're like, people are like, "You know, I I." I, to, I don't even know much about it. I know total knees are done. So that really piqued my interest. And I, we're going to get into that in just a second. But before we dive into that, as it goes, you and I both went to school uh, for a period of time, undergrad, and they had to go to medical school. I went to chiropractic school. And we had to learn anatomy. So, folks, yes, you're going to get a little anatomy lesson today from Dr. Flannery. Give us a, some key anatomy of the knee first, just to lay the foundation so we understand about about a knee what's some key anatomy pieces of the knee yeah so the, the knee is a primary a, a hinge joint but there are three compartments to it so you have a medial and a lateral um, and then underneath the kneecap in the front of the knee um, there's a third compartment that we call the patellofemoral compartment so there's three areas that have cartilage um, there's also the meniscus in there that's an extra shock absorber to provide some padding and stability and then there's ligaments on the side of the knee the mcl and lcl um, and then two ligaments in the center of the knee that sometimes we hear about with sports injuries like the ACL um, and the PCL. And all those ligaments around the knee are designed to, to give extra stability uh, to the joint. So like you just said, too, as far as the function of the knee, it's mostly like a hinge joint. I always equate it to like a door. Jam- like a door basically opens and closes. It's got pretty much two directions, right? Flexion, extension? It does, yeah. There's a uh, kind of pivoting or, or rotation to it. Um, and it, but there is kind of that component of really transferring the strength from our, our quad muscle or our thigh um, to the lower part of the leg. So when we think about uh, stairs or slopes, um, kneeling, squatting down, getting back up, um, the knee uh, really is a is a key for for transferring that that motion. Okay. So um, as far as uh, well, pop quiz, hot shot. How much rotation is there in a knee? Do you remember the degrees? Five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. No, I'm just kidding with you. Um, <laughs> uh, rotation. Yeah, so flexion extension, I mean, we should really see like zero to 140. Okay. Um, in terms of that medial pivot, everyone's a little bit different. It's, knees are really designed to rotate around the medial side slightly. Okay. Um, but for a pretty small amount. Gotcha. Yeah. Kind of like an SI joint in my line of work, too. SI joint's got a little bit of movement, not much, but it, it's got some. But, uh, yeah, the knee, mm-hmm. generally speaking, if it twists too far, that's where we get into some of the injuries, which I'd like to go through some of the common types of injuries that you would see in a knee. So for example, like some sprains, um, what, are, what is, what is a sprained knee typically? What would you see, uh, in, in your clinic as far as a sprain goes? Oh, knee sprains can be a real drain. There's more information to gain about our knees. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Dr. Larry radio show. We'll be right back with more with Dr. Flannery. Dr. Larry. Dr. Larry will be back, back in a moment. Break over. over. Time to get cracking once again with Dr. Larry. Welcome back. I'm discussing knees with Dr. Flannery, orthopedic surgeon for OSMS. Roll the tape. What is what is a sprained knee typically? What would you see uh, in in your clinic as far as a sprain goes? Yeah, so we talk about strains and sprains. So uh, a strain would be more of a pull of the muscle. Um, Sprain would be either to the ligaments or the capsule around the knee. Um, So, you know, commonly with uh, uh, sports injuries, we'll see an MCL sprain uh, where someone may get hit in the side of the knee um, and really stresses that MCL uh, on the medial side of the knee. And um, with that, uh, commonly we can, you know, get some good exam and, and really uh, look to brace it and, and, and let it heal in. Um, and it can do well without, without surgery. Um, but that would be probably the most common sports injury we see. Um, you certainly see lower-grade sprains of kids in gym class and stuff like that. And, 
just an overall feel of the injury. You know, we have them come in, make sure they can walk, um, make sure that uh, uh, they're able to put some weight on it. Um, and a lot of those uh, smaller injuries, you know, uh, some initial rest and, and some stretching and stuff can, can get them back to, to normal. Okay. Um, so that would be kind of your lower level injury. As far as doing a, um, if you could draw a, a line to differentiate for all of us, um, the difference as far as patient presentation comes in between a actual knee strain and sprain, is there some telltale signs, some one, two, or three differentiators that you can see as far as how the patient presents, how they walk, um, some of the symptoms they describe? Because, you know, uh, as people are listening to you talk right now too, and let's say they go out and they're out in their yard, or they're out in the woods and they step in like an uneven pothole or they get out of the car, they hit a, you know, kind of twist their knee coming off a curb or something like that. What would be kind of a main key differentiator between a sprain and a strain uh, and a ligament or even a tear? Yeah, so the, the, the muscular strains tend to be um, near the knee, but not typically right at the knee. So if you, um, you know, strain the hamstring or your quad muscle, um, if you might be in the lower part of the thigh, um, if you strain your gastroc or your calf muscle, it would probably be um, just below the knee, but in the back of the knee. Um, and usually the mechanism of injury can help give that away. Um, if, it's, if it's more of a, a sprain to the joint itself, uh, sometimes we'll see uh, some swelling or uh, effusion fluid on the knee. Um, and, uh, and pain will usually be right uh, at that joint level um, to where, where those uh, ligaments exist that would have uh, the the sh- uh, strain to them or sprain to them. Sorry. Okay. And as far as like your ACL or your PCL tears or your meniscus tears, um, again, you know, kind of help us just theater the mind here, what that sort of patient presentation would look like. Yeah. With, with ACL tears, uh, a lot of times there is a, a pop that's either felt or even audible. Um, usually people then feel like their knee is, is not stable for them. Um, there may uh, be a fair bit of swelling on the knee, um, would be most common presentation for ACL. Meniscus, um, a lot of times, is, is more of a, an injury that could have maybe happened with pivoting or with the knee in a, a bent position, squatting down. Um, and those are usually the things that aggravate it then after that is, is kneeling, squatting down, pivoting, um, trying to uh, navigate stairs where the, the knee is in more of a flexed or bent position. Um, and sometimes there can be a little uh, catching or, or, or locking even with the knee um, with, uh, with a meniscus injury. Um, so those would be kind of the things that we're looking for. Okay. And uh, as you're listening or as you're describing that, instantly I thought of another segment and show about meniscus, tears, repairs, uh, when to scope, when not to scope, and yeah. what. So uh, I'm like, oh, oh, oh right. we, got, we got a whole other topic because I'll tell you, just listening, talking to patients, <laughs> people are like, well, I got a torn meniscus, but they're not going to do surgery. Or I got a torn meniscus and they're going to sur- do surgery. So I, there's a whole other another segment I got on that one. Absolutely. It's, so, yeah. um, now this yeah, one, I would I'm, be happy to go over that to come. Yeah. Common problem we see. Yeah, yeah, and and from an educational standpoint too, just I think uh, as far as uh, people go on their knees. Uh, it's one of those things where they like, well, if I got a tear, shouldn't it be surgically fixed? And sometimes it's true and sometimes it shouldn't. And sometimes it's got to be braced. But yeah, that's a that's a digression. We'll mm-hmm. get to that at some other point in the future. Okay, fractures. Yeah, for now, sure. Now, bones, knee fractures. Now, here's the thing. I have, I'm privy to some information um, because uh, I sent a couple of cases your way. And uh, why don't you discuss knee fractures and what you typically see, what typically, if something's going to fracture, uh, and I'm talking one, not like the obvious, like a big green stick fracture or something like that and a tip fib, but what, what do you see as far as knee fractures go and what is what's a patient presentation? Yeah, so there, there's different categories. You know, you have an acute fracture um, that maybe with, with stronger bones, someone that's younger or healthier, that clearly show up on an x-ray where you have a, a, an obvious line or maybe the bone has, has shifted over and displaced a little bit. Um, and in those settings, you know, people are clearly not able to put weight on it. Um, so those are the more obvious ones and, and treatment varies depending on the location. But um, the less obvious fractures, um, you know, that we call occult fractures where, you know, the, the x-ray may not even uh, pick it up or it may be really subtle on the x-ray. Um, and, and that can happen um, certainly um, as our bones thin a little bit, you know, especially getting over age 50. Um, so in those, in those instances, you really have to be um, 
suspicious for it and uh, and kind of take in a full history and exam. Um, and then in terms of the, the x-rays, uh, it, it may be that um, the fracture is easier to see um, a week or two later. So sometimes we just treat people conservatively with plan for an x-ray again in two weeks and uh, we come back and then as the fracture actually starts to heal, you it shows up better. Um, and so that's one way to diagnose it. Other times we just have a high enough suspicion that we say, you know, we should get an MRI and uh, you can see actual um, impaction fractures or just small small areas where the bone might have gotten compressed a bit um, that didn't have just that classic crack across the bone that we that we think of. Okay, so you just, uh, uh, let me circle back around here for a second because um, I, I, I purposely sent you a case recently. A uh, lady had, it was like a running injury with a slip fall. Um, she was out of the area, got some x-rays. They said everything looked good. She came in here, I examined her, and I said, you know what, uh, why don't you go see Dr. Flannery and see what he says about this one because, um, you know, some, something doesn't feel right, look right. So she went to you and she came back and she had her discs in her hand and she goes, guess what? And I said, you've got a fracture. She goes, yes. I go, I didn't talk to him. I said, I just knew something else was wrong and so that was my first guess. Is it that, so it's is it more so that sometimes on an acute possible occult fracture or hidden fracture that you don't necessarily see it on the initial round of imaging or from an orthopedic surgeon standpoint, do you guys uh, kind of slice dice different sets and angles of x-rays and then can differentiate that a little bit better? Is, there, is it kind of a little mixture of both? Yeah, that was great insight by you, uh, you know, I think to uh, have a higher suspicion and I appreciate you uh, sending her down. But um, yeah, I think there there is um, a component of, of all that and in that we, you know, did uh, get updated X-rays that day, and I, and I think that sometimes um, X-ray quality can be can be lacking, you know, in in certain offices where um, they just aren't as familiar with uh, with with getting those uh, shots. So uh, I, I do think we we got um, X-rays that day that were updated, um, a little bit better angle, and uh, and then um, uh, we were able to just kind of subtly pick it up, just being familiar with looking at the bone a lot. Okay. And because you, you coincidentally too, and there's sometimes things run in, in little series here, but prior to that, I actually have a patient that comes from Marinette to see me in my office for chiropractic and she ended up having a slip fall as well too. So she was going through, she goes, oh, you're not gonna believe this Dr. Larry, I slipped and fell. And she happened to see you that day and she went to you guys first. She was actually out of the area and she goes, uh, but, or no, I'm sorry. She went to an urgent care, then came to see you and you picked up on another missed fracture. So it happened to be back to back cases. Uh, one I sent you, one that happened to be routed my way coming from you uh, for for a spinal related situation. But so in my mind, knowing that I was going to talk to you on the air today, uh, I was going to ask you that question: was it was it more so? And now that you said delay, but sometimes it's just like you said, the quality of the X ray and also um, t- shooting some different angles. Is if I heard you correctly, right? Yeah, that can help. And and we read all our own X rays. Um, which I think makes a big difference, you know, in, in, a, in a lot of clinics, um, there may be a radiologist that reads the images separate from the clinician seeing the patient. And so, you know, if I'm examining someone and I'm kind of honed in, like, you know, where do I think there could be a fracture here based on all this information? Um, you know, I, I can really look at that area and, and just with reading my own x-rays, just so familiar with, with what normal anatomy should look like. Um, that that I think really helps us uh, key in on that. Yeah, great. Well, uh, so that kind of teases up for our actual main topic and focus today, which is uh, partial knee replacements, not total. So uh, when it comes and boils down to it, and like I said in my opening monologue, that uh, whether it's age, time, wear, tear, whatever it is, there may be a point in time where our knees get to the point where we may have to have some work done. We, we, we tried the therapy, uh, we've tried injections, etc. And now we're at a point where we're a candidate um, for some type of uh, extra orthopedic work to the knee. Commonly, and I've been uh, in and board certified chiropractor for 22 years now, and I think I'm north of 80,000 patients, still, still, partial knee replacements are not discussed a lot. And uh, so I, it was one of the things that intrigued me too that was uh, something that we talked about that I thought was very relevant to discuss partial knee replacements. So I, I'd like you to 
dive in that. What is a partial knee replacement? And then after we go through that, I'd like you to compare and contrast that with a total knee replacement. We're getting hinged to this interview with our knees more when we get back from the break. Stay tuned. This is the Dr. Larry Radio Show. We'll be right back. We'll be right back, back, back with Dr. Larry. We're we're back, back with Dr. Larry. All right, we're getting into actually the meat of the show, uh, touching on partial knee replacements. We're going to start that right now. I thought it was very relevant to discuss partial knee replacements, so I, I'd like you to dive in that. What is a partial knee replacement? And then after we go through that, I'd like you to compare and contrast that with a total knee replacement. So when we talk about uh, partial knee replacement, um, we're looking at uh, replacing only part of the knee. So we talked earlier about how there's three compartments of the knee. And if you um, get arthritis to the knee, it can be from wear and tear over time. It can be from a, a certain injury. And uh, at times, the, the, the arthritis and the, the injury are wearing down uh, can really just be to one compartment. And so if that's the case, um, then partial knee replacement is the option to replace just that compartment. And um, with that surgery, you're taking care of the um, affected area, but leaving the rest of the knee alone, um, which includes uh, those other structures we talked about. So uh, with partial knee replacement, we do keep the ACL and PCL ligaments in the center of the knee. Um, you keep the lateral meniscus potentially if it was a medial uh, knee replacement. Um, and so all of those um, uh, differences, you know, can allow uh, for partial knee replacement to take place um, and keep the knee feeling more natural. Um, we still replace uh, both sides, the, the femur and the tibia bone, with metal, and then in between is a polyethylene or plastic insert. Um, so no more bone on bone in the area that was primarily affected. Okay, so uh, as far as the partial knee goes, there are different compartments to the knee depending on where the wear is. Um, how many different compartments would there be in a partial knee replacement, is, if I'm asking that question correctly? Yeah, so the knee, yeah, the knee itself has the three compartments, the medial, lateral, and anterior um, compartment. And what we often see is the medial side of the knee um, takes more weight um, throughout our life and is more likely to wear out. We commonly see more meniscus tearing on that side. And so if the, if the medial side is worn out, we would replace that compartment. And that compartment has um, the, the femur side and the tibia side, so the upper and lower bone, and then the, normally the cartilage in between. So we would replace both sides, and then um, the uh, bearing surface in between would then be plastic. Um, but we would leave the other two compartments of the knee um, to be their own, uh, the original uh, uh, anatomy. So is there a, a subset of, of patients out there who have, let's say, one of the compartments worn down to the point where they would be a, a partial knee replacement candidate? However... I guess I'm I'm drawing upon the theme that kind of circulates around and that I, that is in the air. This, well, uh, wait until the knee is totally shot, then just get it totally replaced. Um, are there people walking around who were that's kind of the mindset for maybe um, you know maybe they've had that opinion from from a different organization or different orthopedic surgeon where. They don't do the partial replacements, but even though one component of the knee is completely worn out bone on bone, but the other two are okay, and they just are advised to you know modify activities and and uh, wait until the knee is completely bone on bone and two to three are all three components. Is that kind of a still a sentiment out there? Or, or yeah, I think that yeah yeah I think that is a, a common uh, perception out there. Yep. And um, as you mentioned, you know a lot of uh, orthopedic surgeons even. Um, may give that advice and, and in part because they don't do partial knee replacement. So, um, you know, obviously there's different uh, schools of thought and I, I think that uh, partial knee replacement um, has really uh, increased um, in, in popularity um, uh, over the last uh, few years. And the, the partial knee replacement, when um, research is done on it, you know, it, it's expected that 20% of uh, replacements really should be partial and uh, the actual usage is less than 5%. So we're underutilizing partial knee replacement. So there's people out there that were just um, not not looking for it, you know, closely enough and deciding if they're a, a candidate for a partial. 
And uh, for example, you know, um, over age uh, 70, um, studies show that um, if you have arthritis in, in one compartment of your knee, um, that you are better off with a, with a partial in that the uh, likelihood of it lasting your lifetime as compared to a total knee is the same. And there's a lower risk of, of complication, including blood clot or having to have the knee uh, manipulated for stiffness after surgery. Um, and so the, the risk is lower and the function is actually better. So we can talk more about that, but um, those would be great candidates for partial knee replacement. The other is someone that unfortunately has arthritis at a really young age. And it's like, you know, whether we did a partial or a total knee replacement, we're anticipating they're gonna need surgery again in their lifetime. That would really be people, you know, in their early 50s um, or younger, especially that live an active lifestyle that are not ready to, to give everything up, um, but that we could do a partial knee replacement with a chance that it could last their lifetime, but more likely they would be converted to a total knee replacement uh, 20 years down the road. Um, but at that time, that would be a smaller surgery than taking a full knee replacement and having to revise that to a, a more extensive uh, revision um, total knee replacement. So that's no, that's excellent, and and you tied into kind of the next set of um, of question that you just asked it too. Now I'm curious um, when I talk to patients and they've had a total knee done, uh, one of the comments that I hear is, "Oh, the rehab was ter- miserable." You know, trying to get the knee, stiff knee to try to bend again, and then once they get past that, they're happy. They're like, "Oh, that was," but that first you know, fill in the blank two weeks, month was just miserable. Um, and, uh, oh, I had to really work hard in therapy. And, you know, it's, again, almost like a little bit of a challenge for them as well, too, but then the pain and et cetera. And then, like you said, once everything kind of uh, clears out and swelling comes down and and the function is back, then they're happy with their new knee. But um, as far as the, the get, doing a partial knee, what's the, the, the post-surgery short-term um, re- recovery rehab like? What's what's the patient feedback on that? I honestly don't have, yeah. and this is how, like you just said with the statistic, which I, you know, I, I two sides of my brain. I'm, I'm, uh, I like the theater of the mind, but I also love data and stats as well too. So the underutilized component of this, what, what are you seeing as far as post-surgery follow-up? What are people, what's the feedback as far as therapy goes compared to what you would say uh, compare and contrast like a total knee uh, rehab and recovery. Yeah. Yeah. So partial knee replacement just overall is a little bit smaller surgery than total knee replacement. So recovery is, is generally a little bit easier and, and a little bit quicker. So um, I would say on average about a month sooner um, that people feel that they are recovered from a partial than a total um, often, you know, inside that three month window, rather than going over that, um, into, into four months or longer. Um, so that, that is, that's what we're seeing. I mean, people really, I think tend to love it. It's, it's pretty neat. You know, sometimes we'll see people come back at, at two weeks and they could have near full range of motion, you know, zero to 130 degrees. Um, whereas my total knees, I'm, I'm hoping to just tell them, Hey, it's going to get better. You know, if they're, if they're at zero to 90 degrees, um, where, you know, it's like, this is a good start and, you know, we'll keep, keep working in, uh, in therapy and, and some of those benefits, you know, go even longer in that, um, on average, the knee flexion, uh, for partial knee replacement, um, is seven to 10 degrees better, um, than, than total knee replacement. And that's, that's the long term outcome, not even just the, uh, during the recovery time frame. Okay. So now we're just going to, um, slice this up a little bit uh, as far as the criteria go. And I know you kind of touched on it, but, um, who or what is the criteria or who is a good candidate for the partial needs? So I, I guess you kind of said who the good candidate is. Like you said, the early on athlete who's got some medial wear on there, which would be the inside part of the knee, um, and then or the elderly 70-plus person. So I guess what would be the, the criteria that you're looking for to kind of screen them out to say this this person's a good candidate? Yeah, I think it's it's uh, every – Every case is different, so it would be a patient-specific discussion. I think we would want to see that, obviously, the arthritis is in one compartment. Sometimes we do get an MRI um, to really verify that uh, to make sure that we're making a, a quality decision with them. I, I think looking at the, the ligaments of the knee is important as well. If, if someone has a, um, a previous ACL tear and they have uh, instability to their knee, 
um, that would not necessarily be the best candidate for a partial. I think we'd really want to find that isolated disease, you know, maybe someone that had a, an old military injury fell right on their kneecap and had uh, worn out the anterior compartment of their knee and the other parts uh, are, are doing well. Um, those patients where you can, you can get them uh, much better uh, function and, uh, and pain uh, control um, at, at that earlier stage in life when they're, when they're still looking to be active. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of this, you know, shared decision making, you know, of talking about the risks and benefits of how long partial knee replacements last, how long total knee replacements last, um, and really uh, getting their feel of, of what would be best for them. Okay. And um, as far as the, the success rate um, on, on those, and I'm going to have you, uh, and I had you do this with the anterior hip, and, and I thought it went really well. Um, I'm going to have you briefly walk us through um, kind of the prep, the type of incision, the tools you use, maybe, like you said, some of the hardware. Um, step us through, uh, you know, like a, a, the procedure um, as far as kind of from an outline perspective. And then uh, discuss maybe, too, some of the anatomy changes you actually see inside the knee. Um, Dr. Tresser just did a, a hip replacement on a lady um, that I sent uh, a couple of months ago, and her, she was actually in today. And she said, uh, by the way, when Dr. Truster got in there, he said it was way worse than the imaging. So I always, from a patient perspective and from a listener's perspective, uh, I always find that that is kind of a unique comment. And, and it really kind of uh, perks up the interest. Be like, well, what do you mean? He's like, he really had to get in there and, and work it. And it was, you know, probably um, some of the damage to the area was worse. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd like you to kind of, um, you know, walk us through the, the partial knee replacement, you know, prep type of incision uh, tools. Uh, hardware, um, and then the, you know a little bit through the procedure, and then discuss some of the when you actually get in there and see it, maybe some of the anatomical changes that you see from uh, as the knee uh, starts to deteriorate. If you mind doing that for us for just a minute or two. This concludes part one of two on our chat about knees. You'll want to make sure to tune in to the show uh, in a couple of weeks. I'm actually going to hit part two of that, uh, and we're going to dive into the knee replacements, and then. Uh, he's going to cover th- uh, the partial knee replacement. I'm sorry, we'll do a little compare contrast. We got some cases we're going to go through as well too. So that'll be in the next series of this show coming up. Okay, our announcements and our tip and trick of the week just around the corner when we get back from the break. This is the Dr. Larry Radio Show. Be right back. Dr. Larry, Dr. Larry will be back back in a moment. <laughs> 